Something in the Woods by May 1400. This story is 100% true, and I'm writing it on here to warn other people, and let them know that there's definitely something out there, and to this day, I still don't know what it was, nor have I gone into any woods or forest whatsoever. If you don't believe me, that's completely fine. Read this as a fun story at your own expense, but to those of you out there with an open mind, or you've seen something yourself, just know you're not alone. Just typing out and remembering this account is causing me to shake with anxiety. First off, I'm a girl and I live in North Carolina of the United States. I was 15 at the time of my encounter, and was definitely not a believer in anything supernatural, paranormal, or anything of the sort. It happened when I was at a local summer camp. There was absolutely nothing special about that day. No weird lights, people, animals, sounds, nothing. It was just the same camp schedule as I'd grown used to in the past two weeks I'd been there. My age group had just finished lunch and was able to persuade our counsellor to let us play a game called Scatter Down by the Lake. It's like a giant hide-and-seek in the woods. Now we had played this game at least 20 times that day before, and nothing weird had happened to any of us. And we all grew up playing in the woods, so it, it's not like we had an aversion or fear to it. But for some reason that day, when our counsellor shouted, Scatter, I ran to find a hiding place. It became a whole new ball game. I had run as far as I could while still being able to see the lake, as were the rules, and had found a huge old uprooted tree that I decided would be the perfect hiding place. So I laid down as close as I could against the ground and waited. I'd been there for about five minutes, when I suddenly heard a voice calling my name, in a weird, dreamy-like voice. And not just any voice. My mom's. Now, me and my mom are extremely close, thick as thieves, so I know her voice anywhere. And I would swear on my own grave that it was without a doubt hers. But I knew it couldn't be her. She was 20 miles away at work, and even if it had actually been her, and she'd come to pick me up earlier, the voice wasn't coming from the lake. It was coming from further out in the woods, beyond the border of the camp. I knew I should have run away from this strange mimic, but I couldn't. It was almost hypnotic. It messed with my thoughts and it gave me doubts like, well, it could be my mom, or what if she's hurt, and I have to get to her. All these things were flooding into my mind like someone had broken a dam I didn't know was there, until they finally overwhelmed me and emotions got the better of me. I took off running in the direction the voice was coming from. I ran as far as I could with only this strange voice as my guide. I couldn't have run for more than five or seven minutes when I got to a clearing, and the voice suddenly stopped. When I entered the clearing and didn't hear my mom's voice calling me anymore, I finally had the chance to think clearly again, and little alarm bells started to go off inside my head saying, You idiot! That's not your mum. Run. But I couldn't run. I didn't know where to run. I had gotten so far away I'd lost sight of the lake by the camp and had absolutely no idea where I was. And I was completely exhausted to boot. With no other options than to just sit and catch my breath, I did just that. No sooner had I sat down... More warning bells went off in my mind. I quickly did a 360 survey around the clearing and noticed a strange noise. It wasn't the continuation of the voice from before. No, it was the distinct sound of chattering teeth 
like if you were cold. Only there was no one else around and it was the middle of June in North Carolina. There's no way someone could be cold. And that's when I heard it. Leaves and sticks crunch on the edge of a small clearing and I realized something was watching me. Whatever it was moved and fast in circles around the clearing almost like it was circling prey. And it was at that moment I knew whatever it was had led me out there and away from the rest of my group, exactly like a predator. My instincts had been screaming at me than it was. Without any other option other than to try and escape, I took off in the direction I thought I'd came from and sprinted as fast as I could while hearing the chittering teeth and the crunching of sticks behind me. I didn't know what to do, so I didn't dare turn around and see what was chasing me. I knew that if I did, I would slow down and I absolutely would not. It felt like a lifetime running away from this, this thing before I finally saw the lake. And even though I didn't think I could, I ran faster than I had ever done in my life. When I broke the tree line and ran to the lake where I knew my friends were. At that point I felt safe enough to stop and look back and see just what had been chasing me. But when I did, I only saw a fleeting form running back the way I had come and the distinct sound of chittering teeth. When I finally found my counsellor, who was the seeker to finding all of us, I was hysterical with fear and hugged her as tight as I could. When I finally calmed down, she tried to get me to tell her what had happened. But I just asked, were you calling my name? Before she even said anything, I already knew the answer. After all, it had been my mom's voice that led me away from everyone else. But what she replied with was so much more bone chilling to me. She told me, no one called for you. We didn't know you were even gone. Everyone's still hiding. The game isn't even over yet. Something Luring Us Into The Forest By Giotso I'd like to share with you a true paranormal experience of mine. To the best of my memory, at my extreme apprehension, about half an hour ago, I call of one of my friends who was present in both encounters to confirm the accuracy of events that I remember. I asked questions carefully and sequentially to ensure that she remembered all of the minor details. Everything was confirmed. I was inspired to share this after reading a post which posed the question, is never experiencing something paranormal more rare than experiencing something. In this experience, I never encountered anything paranormal, but the friends whom I was with genuinely believed they had. Sorry about the grammatical errors and erratic narrative perspectives. It's light. I hope you guys enjoy. Number one is the doppelganger. This happened about 10 years ago when I was in college in Tennessee. I had a friend who was studying photography, and I often joined her to go shoot photos of scenery. One of the favorite photo ops were the local cemeteries. After noticing some strange orbs in nighttime cemetery photos, we became fascinated with the phenomenon and began to pursue the elusive orbs finding maybe a dozen in 100 photos. As a tough guy skeptic, I always brushed it off as dust or bugs reflecting in the camera flash, but it would be lying to say that I was not somewhat intrigued by the suggestion of something paranormal in these cemeteries. One evening, I suggested a cemetery that I had visited before, an hour and a half drive on Country Road in rural Tennessee. With the sun setting, we got in the car and began the trip. This cemetery borders a state park and is surrounded on all sides by miles of dense forest. Save for a long winding road with a few modern and a few very old houses. As I mentioned, I am a skeptic, 
but there is something unquestionably unnerving about the old houses. They look like plantation manors you would see in a history book, or an old painting, decrepit during the day, but at night, on those long, dark country roads, they're ominous beasts looming out of the forest. They're just abandoned houses, but contemplating on the brutal history of plantations in the south, the giant shadows in the forest became absolutely sinister. The state park along the cemetery is home to the ruins of a large, 200-year-old mining operation. Traces of mining are now limited to a series of enormous, gaping holes in the forest floor. Some 50 feet across and 50 feet deep, a once towering pig iron furnace, now only protruding a few mossy bricks above the ground, the abandoned plantation manors, and lastly, the cemetery. In the state park, the families grilling burgers, camping, and the children playing in the creeks are free of concerns of what was happening on the ground they are now enjoying 200 years ago. The sun has set and on the unlit road we pass the old houses with their square frames and tall pillars cloaked in darkness. The moonlight makes their shadows twist and writhe like grotesque living things. As we approach the cemetery, I imagine fleeting visions of a bloody and horrifying history. Slaves brutally forced to dig mines so deep they lost sight of the sun, forced to toil in the searing furnace and handle the molten iron. It dawns on me that whilst the cemetery existed then, there were no graves spared for the workers. My photographer friend and I park on a small dirt shoulder in front of the large cemetery. There's no pavement or parking spaces. The cemetery grounds are unusually expansive. A 1,000 foot wide glade surrounded by vast forest. Tombstones range from newest at the entrance to early 1800s in the rear. Punctuated by lots suspiciously vacant of stones, the oldest stones at the forest edge of the cemetery are little more than small rocks with no visible markings. It is not unusual for small and old cemeteries, but the most ancient stones whose engravings had not yet been completely claimed by time reveal a disturbing fact. Most of the graves are children. At the rear of the cemetery, we cannot see the entrance, merely a solid line of forest in all directions. The moonlit glade is strikingly contrasted against the blackness of the forest, which seems to aggressively reach up towards the night sky, struggling to complete its reclamation of a time in history which should never have existed. The feeling is ominous, and the forest has a threatening presence. After an hour or so of taking photos of the midnight cemetery, we leave without incident. This time. The next day we meet to analyze photos and are stunned at what we see. Orbs, a hundred in a single picture, none in the next. Some that curiously hang over my shoulder in the photos of myself. They are pale but colorful. There are thousands of them in the photos. I strain to remember dust, pollen, and bugs, but can't recall any. I'm confused. One thing is clear. We have to return. A few days later, we resolve to make the dark journey again. Interested by the photos we shared, two friends join us, and we are now four strong. Cameras and flashlights in hand, we once again depart the safety of the campus with the setting sun. The moon promises to light our way again. We approach the plantation manor houses, as if their sinister intentions steal away the once comforting moonlight. Cloud cover plunges us into pitch darkness. The writhing pillar of shadows on the houses are gone, replaced by layers upon layers of shadows. The damaged wood siding on the front of the houses now resembles a monstrous sized version of Rodin's Put de l'Enfer. One of the girls gasps. As we pass the manor, she swears she saw a pale figure in the abandoned window. 
had it been one of the damned souls in Rodin's sculpture. On the dark country road, assaulted by the sinister shadowy structures, it's not so strange to believe that the spirits of heinous slave owners have found no peace here. The clouds are unrelenting as we approach the old cemetery in total darkness. We park on the shoulder again at the edge of the forest on the western side of the cemetery and step out into the cool, crisp night. Into the glade of the forest, we walk east towards the oldest graves. While taking photos, we cannot help but notice a change in the atmosphere from our previous visit. Coyotes howl far in the distance, but the sounds of the forest are discomfortably absent. It's dead silent. The crisp, cool air begins to feel cold. The surrounding wall of trees that once reached for the night sky has completed its effort, and we are surrounded in pitch black, cold silence. Our small flashlights do not penetrate the darkness, they serve merely to illuminate our only companions in this encompassing void the graves. There is no wind, and air feels stale and thick. The threatening presence of the forest is pervasive, and hackles rising, we return to the car. Before departing, I take a small blue pocket flashlight and walk northwards into the forest to relieve myself. As I'm walking back towards the car, I notice the passengers have started it, and seem to be frantically shining their flashlights towards the forest, opposite of the direction I had walked. I reach the car after being separated no more than five minutes. They turn their flashlights north towards me, and the panic begins. The other male in our group was not only a skeptic, but probably the most calm and level-headed person I'd ever known. I had never heard him raise his voice, never seen him get angry or upset in all of the years I had known him. The instant I open the car door, he leaps across the driver's seat and grabs me by the collar yanking me quite forcefully into the car. His eyes are crazed, the expression itself was terrifying. The girls are screaming and crying. The passenger slams my car into gear, and they are all screaming that we have to get out of there. I have never seen people so terrified in my entire life. Racing down the tiny road, the shadowed manors and surrounding forest seemed a little closer to the road than they did on the way in. After we put some distance between us and the manors and the cemetery, my passengers finally calmed down enough to tell me what had happened. A minute or two after I had walked away from the car, they saw my blue flashlight in the forest, the south forest, opposite of the direction I had walked. From the south forest, they then heard me repeatedly calling for help. I had never made a sound. At that moment, they were deciding to go south into the forest to look for me. When they saw me approaching from the north, they completely panicked. They believed some sinister forces very nearly lured them into the forest. Postscript After finding these subreddits and posting my encounter, I began to read of other similar encounters and was absolutely speechless to find that this sort of experience is relatively common. The OP in Slash Paranormal. I titled the post with Doppelganger because I had never heard of Skinwalkers, Fleshgates, or Goatmen. I had heard of a lot of ghost stories, but was posting because I believed that my encounter was strange and unique. I had never heard of an entity trying to lure people out into the woods. I was in such disbelief that this was not a unique encounter that I found the present friends to confirm all of the events. Last night, whilst recollecting my memories of the event, something truly horrifying occurred to me. This was not the first time something had tried to lure us into the forest. Part 2. The Nowhere Police There is a 13-mile hiking trail in the forest which I have completed many times over in the years. I only discovered the cemetery because the trail intersects the cemetery at around the 10 mile mark. There are several backcountry shelters along the trail, two of which I have camped at. The shelters are basically three wood walls and a roof in front of a large fire pit. 
One shelter is about half a mile due south of the cemetery. The trail leading between the cemetery and the shelter is rather well developed, as well developed as a road can be after being abandoned for 200 years. The campsite is named Hall Springs for the array of natural springs that emerge from underground between the cemetery and the shelter. There are ancient stone structures along the abandoned road that appear to be from the same time period as the mining operation. These look similar to chimneys, but there is no central opening, so they appear more like giant pylons, beckoning to something that no longer exists. To reach the Hall Springs shelter, one would typically hike the first ten miles of backcountry. Several years before the first encounter, I had invited a friend and her younger brother to camp with me, who were not as keen on long hikes as I was. Knowing about the nearby intersection with the cemetery, I suggested that they be dropped off there, as a meeting point, so I could quickly guide them to the camp in daylight. A late start for me set our rendezvous at dusk, but they only wanted to camp anyways. The abandoned road makes only about the first half of the half mile from the cemetery to the camp. It's peculiarly wide for a backcountry trail, six feet across, straight and flat, lined on each side by a ditch, then immediately the wall of dense, impassable forest. It certainly feels as unnatural as it is, a perfect hallway to hell in the middle of the forest. After spending the day preparing camp, cutting firewood and clearing brush, I set off on the one-way path directly to the cemetery. The abandoned road, the hallway, offers a strange atmosphere. The wood just seemed wrong, the path out of place. I paid it no mind as I made my way to the rendezvous point. Eventually, I picked up my guests and led them back down the path from the cemetery to the camp. Dusk sets, and the last light faded from the night sky, as I lit a large campfire for cooking dinner and keeping us warm. My friend and her brother came in their own vehicle, against my suggestion of being dropped off. Did not like the idea of leaving a car parked on the side of the road, as there was no parking lot for the cemetery whatsoever. The campfire was comforting. The ethereal fog produced by cold spring waters rising from some mysterious underground source was not. Well into the dark of the night, as the fire waned, we all heard a distinct voice yelling loud from the north. I sat up from my bench bed and stepped towards the forest. The light of the campfire made a sharp gradient, ending immediately in the foggy blackness, so dark even the forest was obscured from sight. Just at the edge of the fire's light, I stopped with my ear towards the voice, discerning whatever I could. Words I could not distinguish, merely a male voice, gruff and loud. While I could not perceive words, there was no mistaking an authoritative, demanding tone. Demanding that I comply with words that I failed to understand. My fears had been confirmed and I knew the source of the voice immediately. The police had found an abandoned vehicle on the side of the road, and were demanding that we return immediately to face the consequences. The voice was commanding us that we come north, back to the cemetery, to answer for our crimes. I am not a criminal, and thought at once that I must return to meet the police officer in the cemetery to explain that we were simply camping, and apologize for the inappropriate parking. This train of thought made perfect sense to me, but simultaneously, it made no sense. We were in the middle of nowhere, at the end of a dead-end road, in the middle of the night. My friends were upset, but not stricken that we had been busted, as I suggested to them. I agreed with them that either the police officer would come down the trail directly to us and we would work it out peacefully, or in the very worst case the vehicle would be towed and we would simply call for a ride home. The night passed with no police officers and no more voice from the direction of the cemetery. With the efficiency of Occam's razor, I had easily explained the voice calling from the forest, 
Yet an uneasiness stayed with me through the night, and I slept waiting for something unknown at the front of the shelter and a kabah firmly in hand. The old mining operation was made possible thanks to a railroad running alongside the forest. Local legends about this area are extensive, as a Google search for White Screamer or Werewolf Springs will reveal. I've made no effort yet to find historical documents regarding to a train derailment, but supposedly one of which was transporting a traveling circus occurred in the 19th century. All animals were recovered, save for two Borneo wild men. These were stories told as Boy Scouts in our youth, and I have never given them any credit aside from the fact that they are, at the very least, very prolific. Perhaps all paranormal encounters can be explained by drawing extraordinary conclusions, as I did by relating my experiences in both encounters. Even as a man of science, I would be lying, however, to say that I am not intrigued by the possibility of which that is far beyond my explanation. An experience shaken out of my memory by Illegitimate Doctor I was going through the top posts of this sub when I saw this. It's about skinwalkers. The TLDR of the link is that a dog owner heard something unidentified in a strange, distorted, mimicking voice calling their dog from the woods at night. Obviously, I can't comment on it, so I decided to share my experience. I haven't thought about this in a good ten years since it happened. I'll start at the beginning, since I'm a storyteller and I love to share all my details. My family moved to rural Pennsylvania when I was four. I was immediately entranced with living in the country, with several acres of woods behind us, and the house seemed huge to me at the time. However, as a kid, I was always sensitive to spirits, or energy, whatever you want to call them. And there were definitely some creepy things going on in the house. So my parents noticed that I stayed with our dog, Bambi, a lot. He was a small sheepdog and my adventure buddy when we went hiking in the woods. And in case you're questioning my parents, they trusted me, as young as age seven, to walk around alone as long as I was with my dog, as he was a very protective animal. My dad would give me his cell phone to carry in case I needed any help. Up until I was about 15, I spent a lot of time alone by choice. After school, I'd be home by 3.20 in grade school, I'd eat lunch and immediately take Bambi out to the woods, and we'd explore the surrounding forest and fields and meadows and ponds together. He was always right by my side, and he seemed really attuned to the spiritual stuff too. If I ever felt something was in the house, he'd bark at it or whine, or I'd watch him follow it around. Usually he'd pick up on the presence of something at the same time that I would. Anyway... From my backyard, to the left, there is a small strip of trees, and in the fall and winter, when the branches are bare, you can see the field next door, which is about 300 yards away from my house itself. There is a big plane shed up there, and a kind of runway where my neighbor would fly his biplanes off of. What's kind of important to the story is that I have no neighbors for a mile in every direction. It's pretty rare to see any kind of people on the surrounding properties, unless it was my neighbor haying some fields in the summer. But one day, in early fall, I'd been tromping through the woods with Bambi for several hours. I'd let him run off leash most of the time, but he would only run ahead about 20 feet and keep turning around to check that I was still there. If I lost sight of him, he'd retrace his steps and find me again. That day I got caught up in whittling something, so Bambi ran off a little bit, and I suddenly realized I was alone. Suddenly there was a lot of crashing deeper in the woods, and I heard Bambi's alarm bark. A lot of yelping, and then some screeching. Raccoons and gophers make a really scary distress sounds, so I figured that was it. I called Bambi, and he popped out of the bush covered in pickers, and since I was spooked, I ran back home with him. Right as I got to the back door, I stopped to catch my breath, and Bambi and I were standing there, when I spotted someone standing at the edge of the runway. 
It ran along the higher edge of the field, and then there was a steep drop-off at the edge of the hill, at the very end of it. They didn't appear to be wearing anything distinctive, but even in the dusk I could see that they appeared completely black, or everything around them was very shadowy and dark. This is the part that gives me shivers. They were standing facing off the runway, and then I saw them hunch over, slowly raising their head, and they yelled, Amy. in the same high-pitched voice I would use to call him. They had the same vocal inflections as me too, but it sounded like it was trying really hard to sound like me. Next to me, Bambi tucked in his tail, lowered his head, and growled softly. They called again, but this time it sounded like they were losing their voice, as if they had been calling for a long time. In my eight-year-old logic, I assumed that someone was trying to steal my dog, but why would they stand there in the middle of the field and be obvious about it? When I told my parents about it that night, they just dismissed the story. The next day I went to my cousin's house, two miles up the road, and my uncle told me about an animal he saw the night before that he was trying to identify. He said it looked like an emaciated cow sprinting across the bridge over the creek, which is about 300 yards from the runway. Also since then, anyone who's been at my house has always been uneasy around the creek and the plane shed slash runway whether or not they're interested in the paranormal at all. I know that a lot of death happens in nature, but I've also found several goats ripped up in the field. The nearest house with any amount of goats or farm animals is four miles away, and a lot of unexplained things have happened up there. TLDR Eight-year-old me witnessed a possible skinwalker calling my dog from the next field over. Hello everyone, Nature's Temper here, just reminding you that we have t-shirts. If you want to support and show your love for the channel, look in the description below. There you will also find a t-shirt design called Bring Back the Wolf. All proceeds of this design go directly to the Rewilding Institute, a charity that I fully support.